Okay. So, uh, Chris Impey from the University of Arizona. Uh, Jerry, it's over to you. Okay, thank you. And now, because we have only two speakers in this session rather than three, I've allowed the speakers to go more than 15 or 20 minutes. I'll be but restrained. But I think we'll still have time for adequate time for discussion. Okay, and, and I am also delighted to be at this meeting. It's, it's a wonderful assemblage of scholarship and breadth, which is I particularly enjoy. I go to my narrow specialist meetings in cosmology where everyone wears the same silly hat and has the same funny handshake, and they're all part of a particular club. Um, there's many clubs here, which is nice. Uh, I'm a professor of astronomy and the academic head of the department at the University of Arizona, and uh, in my spare time I write books, and occasionally I venture elsewhere uh, in connection with Jennifer's talk. We just uh, came back from a, a trip, a fundraising trip for our college, uh, basically sampling the fullness of Galileo's life and the interconnections of the church and, um, and science and astronomy in particular for 400 years and ro roaming up and down Italy. It was a lot of fun. Um, but today I want to talk about something different and perhaps unusually in this meeting, I'm going to give you some uh, asides, if you like, from a non-Judeo-Christian -Judeo tradition. Um, five years ago, out of the blue, I got a call saying, how would you like to go to northern India and teach the Dalai Lama's monks cosmology? It's not the kind of phone call you say no to or think about. You just say, OK, when, and then you go. And so what I'm going to talk about is the result of uh, that uh, experience over five years. And it will actually be the subject of a book that the Templeton Press is going to publish next year. Uh, this is just this is a mock, mock cover, not a real cover, but that's the title, "Humble Before the Void." Um, and I can I have to start by removing you from the this chilly but and austerely beautiful confines of Heidelberg and situating you in another part of the world momentarily. So let's transport ourselves a little to a teeming country of a billion people, a land of contrasts, of enormous endeavors of poverty, of promise, of mystery, of vibrant colors, exotic smells, cacophony of sounds as well, and deep spirituality. My time there has been spent in a series of monasteries in the northern part of India, starting in Dharamsala, which is the seat of the government in exile of Tibet. And I'm going to give you, in little time I have available, a sense of what it's like to work with uh, a set of three dozen monks um, from diverse monasteries around India, all Tibetans in exile, most of whom left. Tibet when they were small children, traveling over the ice fields, sometimes losing fingers and toes to the ice, sometimes losing relatives to the Chinese who captured them on the way out. A man with an enormous lightness of spirit. And this is a little sense of my experience there, teaching them cosmology. This is Dharamsala. I organized my topic. The, the good thing about teaching in a situation so unusual is you take everything you've ever taught about a particular subject, just throw it out of the window and start from scratch. So I organized everything completely differently and recast all the material. And I also had to face the fact that it was a very low-tech place. I didn't have all my usual high-tech toys and gizmos and gadgets. So we just made do with what was available in a pretty poor part of India, actually. transported, we can begin. 
Um, I told the monks that there is, and, and most of our conversations were actually not in the classroom setting as we have now. Most of our engagements were highly interactive in the sort of ultimate sense of hands-on learning. So it was a very dynamic teaching situation. But in the history of seeing the universe, there have only been several revolutions, one of which was the invention of the, or the first astronomical use of the telescope by Galileo in 1610, 1609. Uh, the second of which spread over a couple of decades was the prying open of the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, taking a half-tone range on a piano to a full piano range in analog, going from a factor of two in wavelength to a factor of a trillion in wavelength. Uh, another revolution on the cusp right now is the detection of gravity waves. Essentially, all of our interactions with the universe are, are mediated by electromagnetic radiation. It's emission, transmission, reflection, absorption. We've never seen the universe directly. If we had gravity eyes, we would see things that we could barely imagine, and I'm sure we haven't yet predicted. So there is a revolution actually just around the corner, not, not as well known to most people what's coming, but that's, it's on its way. LIGO is undergoing its full scientific testing phase coming soon. Um, discovery is about surprise, and of course there's surprise more obviously in the creative arts, um, but it's the surprise of imagination and the possibilities of imagination that illuminate our views of the physical world too. Uh, whether it's Isaac Newton imagining space travel hundreds of years before we had the technology to do it, or artists through the ages visualizing the other worlds that we have only just finally been able to discover and visualizing the potential for life on those worlds. So I will definitely echo some of Jennifer's points here. We talked about space, and of course, uh, as a scientist, I am you know, facile and probably glib about large numbers and about order of magnitude estimations, but I realize that even scientists need to experience things in a more visceral way. So by use of analogies and scale models, it actually helped me, in the end, become less blasé uh, about my sense of the size of the universe. And so we were using grains of sand as metaphors, as analogies, and, and sometimes literally. Uh, I had some a beach sand from a beach in Scotland that I was familiar with as a child, which is a shell beach, and to a microscope, those are minute little worlds to the to the distance of your arm's length, they're grains of sand, but they are each miniature worlds. So we did calculations. We started with something proximate to their culture, a sand mandala. We did estimation. And the goal was to get them to experience in their gut uh, the point of knowing numbers and sizes and scales is not to be facile with the numbers. It's to experience it somewhere near your solar plexus. And after some days of working with this, I really think we were all experiencing the numbers like a billion in our solar plexus, which is really important. And we worked with grains of sand. Uh, now this little piece of the Hubble deep field, the ultra deep field, the deepest picture of the sky ever made, that was the Jennifer's last bar, 100 billion times fainter than the eye can see. This is a tiny patch of sky. Every fuzzy dot here is a galaxy, a system of billions of stars. Uh, and this is just a tiny little piece. You can do the extrapolation simply because this uh, piece of the sky is roughly the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. And how many of those grains of sand would it take to cover the sky? Multiply by how many fuzzy patches you see here. That's the number of galaxies in the visible universe. It's an easy calculation, and, and we did it, of course. We had scale models to help us. And uh, I had a little, you know, little uh, earth, a little metallic earth. And on a scale model where the Earth is reduced to walnut sized, one in 10 million or so, then the sun is three meters away, the solar system fits comfortably within the center of Heidelberg type distance, but the nearest star is, is not even on the Earth. It's 50,000 kilometers away. And, and so the issue of looking for Earths around suns is very clear. You're, you're looking for a walnut sized object at a distance of 50,000 kilometers by its reflected light, one part in a billion of the light from the bright object 100 meters away from it. Incredible proximity, incredible overwhelming light from the parent star. That's planet detection in a nutshell. It's hard. That's the first stage of the scale model. We're still just in the solar system, so we shrink by another factor of 10 to the 7. And we take the solar system, the Neptune diameter, down to a typical grain of sand. And in this room, there might be a couple of grains of sand, a couple of stars. That's the distance between stars. 
why, as people now understand, uh, galaxies, when they collide, just pass through each other like diaphanous ghosts. The gravity rearranges them entirely in their orbits, but there's no collisions. It's exceptionally rare. On this scale model, the Milky Way is the size of Europe or India and has, going down all the way to the red dwarfs, about 400 billion stars. And that's, this is the proximate situation, the grains of sand separated by 10 meters in every direction. And you're still only looking at one galaxy. So you go another factor of 10 to the 7, and you take, bring the Milky Way down to the size of a plate. And in this room, in the local group of the universe, there'd be two large plates, us and Andromeda, and a handful of small galaxies, cotton wool. Cotton wool balls we used in our classroom. We actually made, we physicalized almost everything I'm talking about. We made physical scale models and worked with them. Um, and the visible universe in this third reduction in scale, we're now, if you're keeping track, we're now 23 orders of magnitude down from the real world, is the size of India or Europe or a large continent. And about 100 billion galaxies fill this three-dimensional space. So there's the universe in, in three stages. We also had to work with scales of time. And time is an interesting phenomenon because it's, in a sense, ironic. And it's, a, it's an aligning of the Judeo-Christian tradition with a genesis that science has its own story of genesis. It has its own story of a day without a beginning, as Lemaitre put it. Um, because through most human cultures, through most of historical time, prehistoric time, before the written record or with just very simple artifacts, uh, we see an idea that's been encapsulated in the phrase, the myth of the eternal return. Essentially, the most ancient human cultures use cyclic time. Uh, it's natural. It's an alignment of human activity and a projection to the scales, the mystical scales beyond, uh, coupled to astronomical cycles, the cycle of the seasons, the cycle of the diurnal cycle of the Earth spinning on its axis, the lunar cycle. Uh, so not unnaturally, these cycles appear in cultures that never spoke to each other. Lunar calendars were the first calendars in almost every continent of the world before the solar calendar appeared. Um, and so we have these rhythms of the cosmos and in the Hindu tradition that then becomes the Buddhist tradition, cyclic time is a, is a feature. We talked about the Buddhist tradition, of course, and it's intriguing that the, the kalpa, the large time in, in the Buddhist tradition, is 4.32, quite a specific number, in fact, a uh, billion years, or strangely close to the age of the Earth and about a third of the age of the universe. That's a day or night of Brahma. There's actually a great kalpa, which comes out to be of order a trillion years, which is, in cosmological terms, the luminous lifetime of a galaxy before stellar evolution is finished and the thing fades to black, and that's all she wrote. Um, in terms of stellar evolution, it doesn't have to be the end of everything. Uh, the eschatology of galaxies and the universe and its demise stretch to timescales closer to 10 to the 70 or 10 to the 80 years. Well, then they got to reverse uh, my little joust at them of being able to viscerally experience scales, they said, well, how do you understand a kalpa? And I admit it, I didn't really have an intuitive understanding for four billion years. And so one of the senior monks at Geshe tell, approached me at a break and he said, well, the Buddha told a story of a mountain made of granite, maybe a kilometer high and a few kilometers at the base. And once a year, a dove would fly back past the mountain and brush it with the tip of its wing and dis dislodge a few particles. And a kalpa is the time it would take to erode the mountain. And, and thanks to the geshe, I totally got it. I experienced the kalpa somewhere down in here. So this was a dialogue conducted in two directions. Now the next clip, I, I'm not going to explain it or contextualize it. It's in Tibetan. You won't understand a word, and it doesn't matter. This is just a little vignette of the teaching situation, because it's a talk, my talk would be too sterile if you didn't actually see what happened. Um, you'll see a senior geshe. The, the activity involved the groups of monks splitting into sevens or eights and taking 25 pages, each with a picture of an event from the Big Bang to the present day. And they had to organize these chronologically on the floor and then debate it amongst themselves. And then the groups would debate and contest each other's orderings. And monks deba debate, a very formalistic method of debate is, a, is an intense part of their tradition. And they fully adopted it in studying cosmology and in the class. Uh, the person you see presenting is the, the Geshe, the very senior monk in one group, defending his ordering. And you will see 
what seems to be almost disrespectful. Uh, um, uh, but let me just play it and you'll see. <laughs> now i allotted about 30 minutes for this activity it went an hour and a half i couldn't get you know it was like rugby scrum and i was just peering over this hop i was completely superfluous for an instructor or anyone who teaches this is the mother mother load okay uh, and that's pretty much what it was like every day we talked about the structure of the universe and in particular in cosmology we have to talk about the fact that the unity between the very large and the very small is a literal unity because the only way we will it's likely because of the nature of string theory the nature of the microscopic entities we're positing for the fundamental nature of matter that the only place that uh, is realized in a way that might leave an imprint in the observational universe is, is the Big Bang itself. And so there's a quite literal, this Ouroboros is of course an ancient cultural symbol running across traditions, but, and this was used by Sh uh, Sheldon Glashow 30 years ago, it's in the beautiful image, um, but it's literalized in modern cosmology because that's the way we may need to think to make progress. And then, of course, simplicity and complexity are, are difficult subjects. So back to grains of sand again. A simple sand pile is describable by, you know, the very simplest possible equation describing the, the surface and the volume. But the growth of the sand pile requires nonlinear chaos theory to appropriately describe it. It's an entirely non-trivial issue. And so we talked about the complexity. We, we addressed it in terms of how galaxies form, how an initially smooth universe becomes a filigree of large-scale structure, uh, us cascading down in scales all the way to planets and rocks and asteroids, all the way up from huge galaxies with a trillion stars. We also talked about the fact that the, some of these structures and their complexities are not simply predictable. Emergence is a, is a common idea now, and it, and it sometimes is just used as a, a catch-all for ignorance, but it's just the idea that the sum is uh, the whole is more than the sum of the parts, and they're trivial examples, but they're even the trivial examples are a little profound. Uh, a single water mo molecule it clearly is not wet, clearly is not transparent, is not a solvent, and is not polar, um, but water is. Um, individual neurons can't think or be self-aware, no death or create, but a, a, col a large electrochemical network composed of a trillion of them with a thousand times more connections can. And there are other examples. So that just means there's work to be done. For scientists, this is not uh, anything uh, demoralizing. This is just a challenge. This just means our disciplines are still young, and they are. And we talked about life. And life as the special ingredient, if you like, in the universe is, of course, fascinating and intriguing. Um, we look at life now, not in the traditional tree of life, which you might have seen in a biology book, maybe all the way into the 1950s, uh, of a literal tree with humans at the pinnacle, at the top, some conveying some inexorable sense of our place in the scheme of things and the inevitability of us being here. The modern tree of life based on the gradual devi deviations of genetic material over time, where time is running upwards, and this is a tree that runs roughly four billion years. Um, the entirety of primates, including our special selves, are in the real estate of the tree of life and genetic material are smaller than the eye, the dot on the eye of animals. So plants and animals, the large macroscopic species of this planet, are um, you know, sort of uh, contingent outcomes, if you like, or you can use various phrases for it, 
of, uh, of evolution on a largely microbial world. And this, and this uh, perspective has been mirrored into the human genome and human individual just very beautifully in the last few weeks with the talk of the microbiome. So as, as assemblages of, of uh, small entities, we are outnumbered 10 times by bacteria and we are outnumbered 100 times by genes of microbial entities. And we're in this highly symbiotic relationship um, with the sort of kilogram or so of bacterial DNA that we co cohabits with us. So this is a microbial world, and that's what we would expect in the universe too, largely. To take those analogies and scale models and make them literal, I will add in the information, again, it's great that Jennifer talked about planet hunting because you've got the full context for the statement I'm about to make, which is that the sum of the research that's been done, which has taken us to a census of 800 confirmed planets, and actually with the unpublished Kepler data that they're starting to leak into various papers they write, about 3,800 unconfirmed planets. It's, it's huge, it's just thousands of planets now. Um, and with the bar on detection having come down to below Earth mass and below Earth size, with the fullness of the Kepler data having reached now a census of 80 planets in their habitable zones, so there are several hundred, perhaps four or five hundred Earth-sized or Earth-mass planets, and there are separately about a hundred planets in the habitable zones of their stars. But at the conjunct of those, it's still quite a rare category. But the game is on. It is just a matter of time before we find something that all of us would be happy to call an Earth clone. It's going to happen. And if we take the sum of the Kepler data and the simulations that are now quite sophisticated in predicting not just how planets form, but where their refractory and uh, evaporative material, including water vapor, ends up, we can comfortably predict that there should be roughly one terrestrial type habitable world per sun-like star. Also, the planet hunters have decided that looking for your keys under the lamppost is just one strategy. They've recognized that there are many more planets, perhaps 10 times as many planets around low mass stars, red dwarfs, which vastly outnumber sun-like stars. Um, so the real estate is huge. And in simple terms, that leads to an estimate of a billion habitable worlds in our galaxy. Back to the grains of sand, that's the number of grains of sand in the sandbox. In terms of physical inspection through telescopes, measurements with the Doppler effect or the Kepler satellite, only a one meter telescope, it's a thimble full of sand grains. We've just sort of diddled around in the little, our proximate piece of the sandbox we could reach with our hand. That, it's that number of sands of grains. That's habitable worlds. 100 billion galaxies, that's a more difficult intuitive math. That's habitable worlds not just on the full arc of beach into the rear horizon, but on all the beaches of the world. The grains of sand on all the beaches of the world is the number of habitable worlds, the number of petri dishes, to put it biologically, in the universe, as we currently understand it. All of this information really new to the last decade, very exciting time. And so we see a unity of life. Uh, the unity of life that was alluded to by that tree of life is the fact that everything on this planet, from those humble bacteria that live in your gut, to the woolly mammoth, to the elephant, to the orca, are examples of the same thing. It's just one experiment gone awry, if you like, since it led to us, but uh, in a delightful way, I'm sure. But anyway, one experiment. And Buddhism, of course, is very strongly speaking of unity and interconnectedness, and of course, that's what we see in life. The genetic information has also been salutary in denying us any possible sanctuary in, in our easy attitudes towards other races and the people who don't look like us because we learn that the genetic material that makes up visual differences, color, different colors of skin, shapes of nose, type of hair, is a, is a small amount of the genetic material. Um, so there, there's a very small genetic variation. This is just one monolithic experience. So. Um, there are questions to be answered. Cosmology, a young subject, I won't pretend we've had a lot of fun in the last 50 years. I'll call mature cosmology since the Big Bang Theory has been corroborated by evidence. Uh, but as for answering f profound questions like the nature of time and space, the nature of the matter, of course, the normal matter of people and particles in this room is dwarfed seven times over by dark matter whose nature we don't understand. 
uh, scientists are not, uh, you know, they're not silent about possible causes for the Big Bang, but those are in intensely speculative theories that, that definitely verge on metaphysics. And that is also true of the, met the multiverse idea, which posits that the, since inflation produced the universe and each galaxy from a quantum seed, that this quantum substrate state might have led to other possible events and other possible universes. That's the multiverse notion. And then, of course, the profound one of are we alone? And I think for humans, are we alone doesn't mean are there other pond scums out there on planets that have water? That may excite some of the scientists. It may not excite the man or woman in the street. I don't know. Um, so these are issues that we're, we're still coming to grips with. Um, but there is a nice story here, the story of atoms. It's been alluded to as well. And I like to think of that story of atoms and our interconnectedness. We all, we all, all of our particles, you know, shared an origin, an unspeakable origin in the heat and density of the Big Bang, and then went the myriad ways through multiple generations of stars, all more than four and a half billion years ago, to become the temporary and transient uh, parts of your bodies now and then to be in this room together. It's quite, if you plotted the space-time trajectories of our atoms, it's a pretty amazing story. I've never seen anyone visualize it well, but it, it is an amazing story. So we do feel like we, we're special. We act like we're special, definitely. And when I'm talking about, of course, I'm not going to address the title of my talk, The Human Condition, I'm actually, personally, I'm a little more interested in what's the orca condition or the elephant condition um, because I'm, I'm not so sanguine that we are so special in all of the ways we think we are. We have extraordinary capabilities, but uh, the Buddhists and I, in our conversations on the spectrum of sentience and the capabilities of animals, they had some insights and things that I was not familiar with. So there's no simple answer to the why are we here question, nor are scientists really tasked with answering that. Um, but I found, at least in my dialogue, and educational experience with these extraordinary young men in India, uh, that it made me think anew about my subject, my place in the universe, my place with my fellow human beings, and that has been very inspirational for me. So I'll just leave you with a, a couple of minutes of vignette, a little, little lightning up in the early afternoon here, in case we get dozy.
After these two mind-blowing presentations, I'm sure there's going to be some questions to put them on the spot. Michael. I have a question to Chris. Could you explain a bit what gravity eyes are? Gravity eyes? Uh, you mentioned that. Gravity uh, waves. Oh, gravity waves, yes. Um, so as a, um, a straight prediction of general relativity, which when it was made could not be tested, um, is that any change in, the gra any change in a gravitational si situation, uh, the mass or the configuration of the mass, leads to the propagation of a signal at the speed of light, which is a, is a ripple in space-time, to put it you know, a, as an analogy. But in mathematically, they can be compression waves or refraction waves. And so um, the detection of that has been beyond the realm of possibility until the last 15 years. And so uh, gravity waves have actually been indirectly detected that led to the Nobel Prize to Hulson Taylor for binary because uh, it, rapidly spinning objects like pulsars will be radiating gravity waves and a binary pulsar was observed to be in spiraling in the 1960s and it was doing so at just the rate commensurate with the radiation of gravity waves. They're reducing the orbital size, so that that Nobel Prize in physics was essentially awarded to an indirect detection of gravity waves. What we have right in front of us now with LIGO, these twin gravity wave detectors, uh, is the direct detection of the distortion of a, of a sort of reference mass, if you like, by r laser interferometer of the ripples in space-time propagating through this test mass. And the... Uh, the epistemological outcome for a common sense mind? You mean what the experiment measures or what kind of phenomena we're looking for? So, but the phenomena that are predicted, so this is the most delicious scientific situation to be in because you, there's a rich phenomenology that you expect that you can predict with computer models that is, that, you know, the National Science Foundation gave a half a billion dollars to this. And if, if when I try and imagine the scientific leaders, getting hard-nosed congressmen to sign on to this project. It's so hard to describe. I, I'm always impressed. And basically, uh, stars will always collide and coalesce in relatively small fractions. So neutron stars colliding and coalescing with neutron stars or black holes or black holes with each other. Supernovae where the explosion is not completely symmetric, which should be the general situation. All of those will give gravity waves. And the experiment that's coming online should detect any of those situations, not just in the Milky Way, but out to the distance of the nearest thousand galaxies. That's predicted. And then the part that's not predicted is that the Big Bang, the very early universe, was a, was a cacophony of gravity waves of the kind it's very hard to predict their nature. And so any cataclysmic events in the early universe should generate gravity waves. And the, concern of the theorists there is they don't know what signal to look for. And the worry is you throw the baby out with the bathwater because you have to filter a, a ton of noise. It's a very noisy experiment. So you have to put filters on the experiment to detect things that you know very well, like gravity in spiraling, and then hope that you discover the things that you don't know. Always the d issue with a science experiment. Thank you. <clears throat> Bob Russell from the Center for Theology and Science. Uh, Thank you, uh, Jennifer, very much for the, the talk. But since we've got um, John Brooks here, who's done so much to debunk the conflict myth, I want to call you on your representation of Bruno. He wasn't martyred because of his belief in many worlds, right. because of his Christology and his trouble with the finances of Florence. And I've had that argument with Paul Davies. He always says the same thing. I always say, Paul, that's a myth. So I didn't want to see you pro pro propagate no, the same No, I didn't, I didn't even mean to imply that. I did mean to imply that he was somewhat outspoken in his, in his various unorthodox right. views. Right. And, and, and for that, I think, is what he got in trouble. But exactly. no, he was not burned at the stake for his many worlds. View. Exactly. The second thing is, in Ted's survey, the real point of Ted's survey was it was the atheists 
or the agnostics who say people of religious faith will have problems. Exactly Paul Davies' point. Yeah. Paul is speaking not as a person of faith, saying he'll have problems. He's speaking about us. Mm -hmm. And he's wrong because we say we won't have problems. He says we will, but we won't. Yeah. So it's another myth. I agree. Okay. Leiden University and editor of Cycle. I was fascinated by your Science for Monks uh, teaching, but I wonder, uh, it's not just bringing science, it's also uh, coming into a situation with uh, its own, say, politics. Uh, it's some of the leaders of the monasteries that are not too happy about th those projects. Uh, it's part of a kind of reform or, well, it's a very complex Tibetan world. Uh, did you, as a outside to get any sense of, not just of the science, but of the, well, how it landed? Yes, yes, good question. And, and I think in this program, as in others, I mean, the Dalai Lama, His Holiness started this program in 20, to the year 2000, and in this sense, as in others, he's a visionary, he's a general well ahead of his troops, if you like, he's, he's very visionary. And he has famously said that if he hadn't been picked as the 14th reincarnation of the Bodhisattva of Compassion, he would have been an engineer. So that's the way he thinks. Um, and indeed, you're right. In the monasteries, uh, the major monasteries, especially down south, the leaders have not always been on board with his goal, which is to have all of his roughly 25,000 monks trained in math and science as part of the monastic tradition. But very major progress has been made just in this last year where uh, the leaders of those large monasteries have agreed to put math and science in the curriculum. Now, when I've been part of a, this program where we have three dozen monks and it takes three years and six workshops to fully train them, and it was pointed out to him that, you know, you have 25,000 monks, this will take a thousand years, you know, he just gave his signature giggle and, you know, just waved his hand, you know, because he takes the long view. Um, and so the other piece of the program that I haven't talked about is we're training leadership cohorts we're training people to teach, which, which is hard. We're trying to teach them the basic science and math, life science as well. I'm just the cosmology piece of this program. Uh, and then teach them how to teach and give them a support structure how to teach and also give them skills that are kind of very useful, like how to build science exhibits and take them out on the road to local Indian schools. So we're trying to build leadership cohorts within the monasteries that will then propagate it so the Western instructors don't have to go and do it all the time. I think Andrew's next. If I can go back to uh, Jennifer and the prospects of discovering whether there's life elsewhere. I suppose one way to do it would be if we knew how life here began and we could estimate how probable or improbable it is and then we knew about the atmospheres of these planets, we could begin to say something. Trouble is, we don't know how life began here. So the other way to do it is to look at the absorption spectra of the planets during a transit. And I wanted to ask two questions, really. One is, how close is the instrumentation to being able to do that adequately? What further developments are needed? And secondly, to what extent is there consensus about the kind of signatures that would indicate uh, life on these, uh, on these extra planets? Let me try to answer the second one first. So it's very, uh, first of all, it's, it's not easy to define life. So of course we have to start with life as we know it on this planet. You can go away from Earth and look back and take a spectrum of the Earth or, or a spectrum of the Earth reflected off the moon or various things you can do to try to see how you would recognize from afar that there's biological activity on the Earth. And there's certain things you can see. Uh, you can see in the spectrum of Earth light or Earth shine. You can see evidence of water. You can see evidence of ozone. Oxygen is produced in our atmosphere uh, mostly through the activity of plants and biological activity on the ground. So one obvious thing to do is to look spectroscopically for evidence of oxygen in the atmosphere of an exoplanet because at least on this planet oxygen has to be continuously replenished um, or else it, things become oxidized and you lose your oxygen. So that's one, uh, one uh, biomarker the way we use it in astronomy. Uh, I think um, methane is an interesting uh, uh, molecule to look for. It can be geologically produced but it can also be produced 
uh, biologically, and there are different signatures between those two. And so uh, we've seen it on Mars, actually, but uh, not necessarily biologically produced. But that is one another uh, interesting uh, biomarker, the way we use that term. Um, and then, of course, we're interested in water vapor as, as a sign that the planet might be habitable because we're thought, we think that all life on Earth requires some kind of liquid water to maintain itself. So if we can find evidence that there is liquid water, which could be seen in evidence in water vapor in the atmosphere, that could be evidence not that the planet is necessarily inhabited, but that it's habitable. So spectroscopic uh, techniques are still being developed. Astrobiology is, is, is one of the key uh, di new disciplines now to try to figure out what kinds of things to look for in the atmosphere of an exoplanet to see if there might be life. And I forgot your first question. What is uh, how far is the instrumentation? Oh, the instrumentation. That is incredible. So we're now, uh, you, you're, you're trying to find, at least for the ability to do imaging and spectroscopy, so you can do some of this kind of analysis on the atmosphere, you want, uh, hopefully, to be able to isolate the planet from the star, so to block out the starlight. This is called light suppression. So light suppression techniques are, take various forms of trying to do that. And right now, you need something like the ability to, 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 to suppress to the order of a billion times the, the uh, brightness of the star to isolate the planet. And we're getting to that point in the laboratory right now. So within, I'd say we're within an order of magnitude of being able to easily isolate Earths from bright stars, at least in the laboratory. Now the issue is we need to build, build telescopes that have um, a wide enough aperture, a sensitive enough uh, collecting platform to be able to host these light suppression instruments to be able to do this. I would really say that it's a matter of budgeting more than any technological roadblock right now. There, there all, are all sorts of technological challenges, but they're not, there's no insurmountable roadblock to doing this other than national budgets that could be an insurmountable I, I just a, a brief comment on that because yeah. it's going on at my institution um, we we are well on the way to being able to do what you're asking um, it's hard to do in space because we don't have big instruments in space JWST um, will be launched in a six and a half meter telescope but it wasn't conceived of with this type of science and and it's so it's not optimized for it um, the problem with Kepler that is not aware to most people, is Kepler staring at one patch of sky, and so the stars that it's finding planets around are really too faint, even if you subsequently could go back and block out the star to do this kind of work. They're, they're 100,000 times fainter than the brighter stars in the sky. It's, they're too faint. That's just a problem. So we also have all-sky surveys for more nearby planets that are brighter stars and more light. We have a uh, the large binocular telescope in Arizona that, that my university is a one third, one quarter partner of, and we built the mirrors. We have the plan of a nulling interferometer, which will take the light from the twin mirrors and, and, and model it with adaptive optics and suppress at the one part in a billion level required. And with a big light bucket like that, you know, far bigger, the Hubble Space Telescope, as you remember, is not even in the top 50 biggest world's telescopes anymore. It's a pretty small light bucket. So we have a a killer app, if you like, of that telescope is to image Earth and to have a big enough light bucket that the, the puny light is dispersible into a spectrum to look for biomarkers. And then another little piece just on how the science is done, because you alluded to the fact that it's not easy to be sure, there's a, a, several groups in the astrobiology network that NASA has that are doing simulations, because the game has moved from planet detection to planet characterization, to understand the geology and atmospheric physics of these planets. And two groups are modeling exoplanets and essentially producing grids of models of different Earth and Earth, super Earth type planets with and without tectonics, with and without outgassing, with more or less water, to try and simulate the diverse and fairly crappy spectra that you might get through the next generation of instruments because it won't be a killer, it won't be a smoking gun, it won't be a really sharp signature. The, the detection of biomarkers is going to be a slightly frustrating process played out over a decade, but I think it'll happen in, within that time frame. Okay, we've run out of time, but I, I'll take one more question from you. 
Thanks, Owen. It's Michael Murray from the Templeton Foundation. This is really more a question for Paul Davies, who's not here. Uh, and it's a follow-up on the slide that Jennifer had. So, you know, it's an interesting question how the um, discovery of, if in fact we discover it, life or intelligent life in other parts of the universe um, plays into different theological traditions. But since Paul mentioned the Christian one, I guess I would just say this. Um, uh, many of you in the room know that there's been um, a mountain of work done in the last decade or two decades or so on various models of the incarnation. And I think what one has to do is ask two questions um, about um, the implications of that doctrine for the, such discoveries. Number one, what's the theological purpose of the incarnation in the first place? Is it just about redemption of fallen creatures or is there something that enhances the goodness of the universe as a whole? Uh, by the incarnation taking place. And what the implications are for such discoveries will depend on how you answer those two questions. But there's nothing intrinsically paradoxical regardless of the answer that you give. The second is what, what are the models for how the incarnation could actually uh, be, can be, how could it be understood? And even there, I think when you work through the different models that are currently on offer, I, I don't actually see a problem with any of them. Uh, regardless of how you answer that question, whether you think that incarnations have to be something that take place on multiple planets or on, on only one, I, I simply don't see the problem. So I, I see a lot of people saying that there is a problem, and I don't know anybody that's described exactly what the problem is. <laughs> I, I'm not a theologian, but I, I agree with you. I don't, I don't think there's a problem. Any interpretation of that that I've read, and there are certainly theologians here who could address this when I can't, but but uh, is that this redemptive act is, is uh, effective for all of creation, if you will, in some way or another. So there, isn't, there, there wouldn't be a problem if there were other beings elsewhere. Uh, what I do find interesting is that scientifically, we are all interested in looking for algae or bacteria on another planet right now. And philosophically and theologically, everyone jumps to the question of intelligent civilizations, which is a much harder leap for us to, to ever in encounter, even if they're out there. So I'm wondering if we are paying enough attention to the, the theological impact of even finding simple life elsewhere. I mean, everyone kind of skips over that like that's no big deal. But really? I mean, is it really going to be no big deal if we find... Uh, bacteria or algae or plant life on some other planet, I think that actually is going to have a pretty big impact. Okay. But, uh, or just one minute, this, yeah. uh, or just to echo a question or comment about the special nature of carbon. In our solar system, we may have the life 2.0. If we go to Titan, ethane, methane, ammonia, and water, those are the ingredients. The theory says you can have biochemical networks potentially in that domain. So not, we don't have to go far to potentially find a you know, resetting the whole scale on what biology is. So I'm about to get a D minus for having let this go so badly over time, but why don't we thank our panelists and we move to the next one. Thank you.